but it was a, it was a remarkable yeah. piece of work. The effort that went into this, to getting everything right, the punctuation absolutely right, the spelling was flawless, the grammar was perfect. Unfortunately, it took two years to get a paper published. <laughs> but woe beside you if you tried to publish it in cancer. <laughs> or in your career you were dead in the water. Uh, the irony of it was that, uh, that um, uh, Stuart's obituary in the journal came out two and a half years after he died. <laughs> <laughs> Howie of the Hunt celebrated Howie Code of Practice said he could have been many things. He could have been a great research worker, which he could have been, and he did some very original and, and quite remarkable research. He could have been the founder of a great department and founded a pathology empire. He didn't. Instead, he devoted it all to the Journal of Pathology and Bacteriology. He used to carry it around with him. He used to correct the proofs in the Senate meetings. He'd correct proofs on trains. He was a truly remarkable man. I first met him in 1945, just as I was starting to do uh, 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 clinical medicine after two years slaving in the anatomy department. And he gave me some very sage advice. I remember him, the thing was he was a smallish man, and the thing that struck you was his tremendous energy and also his penetrating eyes. And by that time his health was failing, so he must have been a quite remarkable character. So that was Stuart. Willis was a totally different kettle of fish. Stuart was bonhomous, he would have a drink with anybody. Uh, Rupert Allen Willis, who had a, a very varied career, he'd been a, a, a sort of a, a horseback GP in yeah, the, uh, yeah. out in, out in South Queensland. He yeah. was a totally different man. He had, he had this ability to take a group of people and unite them together, bring you together for a common purpose. And this we used to call, call a circle of Willis, not surprisingly. <laughs> and it was demonstrated in a variety of ways that the most palpable way was the Friday afternoon. About 10 to 4, work stopped, all the junior research workers and a couple of junior lecturers cleared the, the laboratory out, set out microscopes and bits of paper on which you could write notes, and you go, went round the microscope, everybody brought a slide from somewhere, a, a diagnostic problem. People would come from the other side of the Pennines to go to these Friday meetings. Later, I used to come from a very distinguished pathologist, great pathologist from Doncaster. He used to come from Hull regularly. Fletcher used to come on a regular basis from, from Scarborough and so on. So he had this ability to draw people in. What would you do? You would go round it, then you would start at the most junior member of the staff, and you'd say, now and so so what do you think about that? And he had this way of actually extracting information without making the person feel under pressure or feel small if they didn't know. He was a truly remarkable man. Um, <coughs> why did Willis retire? Well, he retired because he had chronic pancreatitis. He did not get this by overconsumption of alcohol and he didn't have a stone of the common file diet. He had it explored <coughs> and incredibly nobody took a biopsy. So he never believed that it was a fibrotic lesion. He always thought, I've got my creative cancer. And I think there's not the stuffing out of him. He was not a man who was ever put off by anything. Well, why didn't he stay? Well, that was probably the main reason. And the other reason was the terrible problem of dealing with the general impertinent leaks. The general impertinent leaks in the 1950s resembled nothing so much as Afghanistan. <laughs> and the war, in fact, the warlords fought over, not over opium or small arms or um, rocket propelled grenade, they fought over beds. And I remember when the small um, uh, metabolic unit was set up, there was a question that there were two beds, Buckshee on Ward 7. 
Well, you should have seen the fur fly. Who was going to get those beds and the machinations and so on? Beds, one bed, by the time you retired, that would have generated £10,000 towards your, towards your retirement. That was what made the place go. There was no money. We did not get, in those days, any proper funding at all. And I think this is what, in actual fact, did Willis in. He said to me, I'm going because I feel I cannot be a proper head of this department. Which was an incredible thing to say to a junior. Stuart was a man you could, you could respect and admire. Willis was a man you could respect, admire, and love. He was a truly remarkable. Both of them gave me enormous help. And Stuart, of course, um, had this ability to place people right right situations but uh, Willie said pathology whether we like it or not is going to become increasingly specialized we need to require certain skills now this is a question of embryology I think was was quite remarkable my introduction to Willis was when I first qualified in 1948 I was in Petit Curie and I picked up this book the pathology of tumors and I think one of the things that, that I had always found so difficult in pathology was that some tumors were absolutely incomprehensible. You just couldn't understand them. Why them? They said, well, that's the way they look like this, and you've got to know how. <coughs> Willis made this totally understandable and comprehensible. And the Borderland of Embryology and Pathology, I thought, was another great book. And I've got all three of them. The Spread of Tumors in the Human Body, the pathology of tumors and the borderland of embryology and pathology. So those were the two great people who were living here. And of course you've seen various other people. Um, Stuart's ability to run the department was based essentially on picking good, very good juniors. And who did he pick? Colin J. Edmondson Wright. Wright was a very, very, very able pathologist indeed. Wouldn't say woo to a goose. Went as, as, as professor at uh, University College uh, Cork. Uh, the other, of course, was Thomas Worsley Sutherland. His father had been a, an extremely yeah, respected and revered, the foundation professor of, of, of forensic pathology in Leeds. Sutherland, of course, everybody who knew Sutherland had respect for his, his ability. And uh, those people carried the department on. And it's very interesting. I found your talk absolutely fascinating. <coughs> Years dropped away. <laughs> 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 and <coughs> so many of the people that made this a very, very nice place to work in. I came here, first entered the department on Armistice Day, 1953. I come from London. I came up on the Queen of Scots Pullman, <laughs> platform nine, Kings <laughs> Cross Station, twelve o'clock. Arrived at Central, which wasn't Central, three fifteen. Walked up here. The first person I met when I came in the door was Court Zinnemann. Zinnemann said, "You must be Anderson." Leo. So I said, "Yes, I am." So he said, "Well, welcome to the Algernon Firth." He said. I hope you'll be very happy here. I'm sure you will be. And I was. And I think because for some peculiar reason, um, my cousin, Professor Dixon, has very pointedly set out first career. They were great carpet manufacturers. The other thing they used in, of course, in industrial qualities was dye stuffs. And the Brothertons, of course, were Yorkshire dye wares and chemicals who made all their money out of, out of acquiring the patents of I.G. Farben uh, from the custodian of enemy patents in 1918. So that's where part of their money came from. And uh, um, um, first, it probably was, was um, instrumental in pressuring Charles Brotherton Radcliffe into giving that thousand pounds that enabled them to put out. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. 
I'm very grateful to you for listening to me in such patience. It's very nice to be here and see you.